Hello, bros. We're back with Mars Without Venus, the study of some homosexual generals, Major General Frank M. Richardson. And we come to the chapter of the title's namesake, Mars Without Venus. Prince Eugene, Eugene of Savoy, Le Prince Francois Eugene de Savoy, Carignan, 1663 to 1736. Prince Eugene is known to the average British reader, which I am not, if he is known at all as our great Duke of Marlborough's faithful comrade in arms. If we tend to think of him as Marlborough's second in command, the Duke himself never did. Marlborough's possessed Marlborough possessed to a high degree one of Lord Wavell's requirements of a great general, the ability to get on well with allies. This was evident in his impeccable relations and cordial friendship with Eugene. It was said that they complimented each other. Why do I always get texts and <sighs> like two bodies, but with but a single soul? Eugene's forces may have been less powerful, his financial resources less sound than those which Marlborough could command. But the Duke always regarded Eugene as a great general, as well he might, since Eugene was in due course to be on Napoleon's list of great captains. Marlborough himself is not on that list. That will show those presumptuous English soldiers. A French biographical dictionary, Biography Michaud, delivers the coup de grace to perfide Albion, saying that Eugene was the greatest general of his time since he came between Turin and Frederick. It is at least arguable that Marlborough could have dealt with Turin as effectively as he did with Tallard but to the jealous Corsican, always so easier to be thought. A true Frenchman, Marlborough would have, would not have commanded himself by having the effrontery to beat a French marshal. But Napoleon might have had some fellow feeling for a general who shared with him the distinction of an affectionate nickname bestowed by his own soldiers. Anyone who has read much about these two men, especially any British reader, should be compelled to agree that Marlborough earned his Corporal John much more honestly than did Napoleon in his, did his, did Napoleon his little corporal. In 1734, Frederick sat at Eugene's feet and later told his secretary, Decott, it was then that he deigned to instruct me and gave me those great rules and maxims which I have never forgotten. Eugene, in his memoirs, described the king, saying, No ceremony, I am come to chat with my master. Prince Eugene of Savoy must not be confused with Prince Eugene de Beauharnais, Napoleon's stepson, and much the nicest man in the emperor's family circle. Nicholas Henderson, one of his biographers, calls him Eugene, which may remind us that a famous German battleship, Prince Eugene, Eugene was named after the great soldier. Born in Paris in October 1663, son of an Italian mother and a Savoyard father, Eugene dedicated his life to the service of the House of Habsburg. Though an Austrian general, he thought of himself primarily as a prince of Savoy and signed himself impartially as Eugene, Eugene or Eugenio. Derek McKay, Eugene's last biographer, says that Marlborough was one of the last, the few lasting friendships of Eugene's life. Although they were so different in character, Marlborough was handsome, charming, a family man intent on founding a dynasty inclined to be uxorious and parsimonious to the point of being called mean. Eugene, an unimpressive, even ugly man, showed little interest in money, family, women, or flattery, and sublimated everything to military success. He was reserved, reticent, did not lay himself out to charm, but frequently showed princely hospitality. Eugene's frequent ill health and Marlborough's liability 
severe headaches when planning battles were very likely what we now recognize as psychosomatic, though probably not from similar causes. The slaughter at Malplaquet, Malplaquet, Malplaquet made Marlboro ill for a fortnight, but left Eugene as unmoved and impassive as ever. I count this as a point against Eugene, and the Encyclopedia Britannica rubs it in by describing his him as despising the lives of his soldiers as much as he exposed his own. Exposed his own? Right, anyway, let's go back here. Much more honestly than did Napoleon, his little corporal. Let's we'll see what the footnote says. Here's Marlborough's greatest descendant's justification of the nickname. He performed to the very most faithfully and vigilantly the daily duty of a soldier. We find him at 61 in poor health, racked with earache and headache. After 10 years of war, making these personal reconnaissances within deadly range of the enemy's entrenchments and batteries in order to make sure that his soldiers were not set in possible tasks and their brave lives not cast needlessly away. Marble, his life and times. W.S. Churchill. Eugene's parents were seldom at home, and he was brought up by his grandmother, Marie de Bourbon, and by an aunt, his mother, Olympia Mancini, curious echo of the strange Olympias, chapter 3, was promiscuous, possessive, and much involved in court circles. Louis the Fourteenth was urged by Queen Christina, the ex-queen of Sweden, to marry her, and according to the Duc de Saint-Simon, the king refused to leave her side before or after his marriage. She was suspected of having poisoned her husband and plotted to kill Louis the Fourteenth. Her neglect of her son culminated when she had to leave France when he was sixteen. A remarkable woman, but not much of a mother. <laughs> Uh, when family stability, what family stability Eugene had was provided by his grandmother, Eugene's official biographer, Count Alfred von Arneth, wrote that no man was more subject to fabrications and errors about his character. He certainly exposed himself to scandal during his youth. The unfriendly Duchess of Orleans accused him of homosexual antics with lackeys and pages, called him a little slut and declared that he often played the woman with young people. Nicholas Henderson wrote that Eugene was known as Madame L'Ancien by his contemporaries and belonged to a small, effeminate set. That included such unabashed perverts as the young Abbey de Choise, uh, de Choise, I've never heard of this person, who was invariably dressed as a girl, except when he wore the lavish earrings and makeup of a mature woman. We may think we may, I think, agree with Derek McKay that this odd conduct could have resulted from his mother's neglect of him. The laxity of her household and her failure to show any affection for her son. Once Eugene left France, it seems, there was no further accusations of homosexuality. He was at first trained for the priesthood. Louis the Fourteenth called him the little Abbey and considered him too weak to make a soldier, but Eugene was determined to become one and he turned his back on his old coterie. His upbringing had left him a reserved and cautious individual who put great stress on his own honor and integrity. He had a friend, Francis, Prince of Commercy, from whom he was inseparable, but we need see nothing unusual in such comradeship between two youths training to become professional soldiers. Eugene rose rapidly in his profession, becoming a lieutenant general at 25 and being obviously better qualified for such rapid promotion than any than other young princelings. During his earlier campaigns, he was criticized on account of brutalities committed by his troops. More than one massacre of Turkish prisoners, everyone, including Napoleon, seemed to massacre Turks and the uh, castration followed by the slaughter of 200 French prisoners. Let us say that he was rather young and inexperienced to control the excesses of men accustomed to the brutality of the Turkish wars. In his early 30s, he was described as physically un 
prepossessing. He wore a plain brown tunic in preference to the decorative uniforms worn by those of his rank. This may have been the reason for his men calling him their little capuchin, but soldiers are observant critics, and they may have noticed monastic habits unusual among military men. He was certainly not interested in women. I do not know when or by whom he was given his nickname of Mars without Venus. Sir George MacMunn, who continued to call him the Little Abbey, Louis the Fourteenth's nickname for him, contributed the archly obscure observation that he was notoriously unaffected by the seductions and blandishments of his class, and though in later life not insusceptible to female charm, he loved none too well. Count Alfred von Arneth attributed Eugene's insusceptibility to women to his great self-control. This, Nicholas Henderson shrewdly observes, tells us more about the strabismus mid-Victorian author than about his subject. I would substitute for Mr. Henderson's adjective, which implies squinting, the coined word claustromyopic, which would apply to many, to many Victorian writers. Thought strabismus was when you had cross eyes. Maybe I'm wrong. Derek McKay, speculating about Eugene's homosexuality, concludes that on the whole, the evidence points to an indifference towards physical or close emotional relations, which was part of a makeup which stretched stress self control both in actions and speech. Here it is time to quote some of Eugene's own words from his autobiographical memoir. This short autobiography, published in 1827, seems to have been overlooked by subsequent authors, possibly because it was not published separately under Eugene's name, but as part of Chapter 8 of a collection of the most instructive and amusing lives ever published, written, written by the parties themselves. Perhaps it is a forgery like other writings attributed to Eugene, but it sounds convincing, and it is certainly amusing. Maybe that's why no one else wrote about it, you fucking dullard. It also brings Eugene alive as a rather endearing person. In an engaging preface, Eugene chided a writer called Dumont, whom he called a flatterer for praising him at the expense of Turin. What stupid stuff. For But for the English, he wrote, I should have given law in the capital of the Grand monarch and shut up his maintenon in a coven for life. He may have felt like revenging himself upon Louis for saying that he was too weak for military service, as a result of which he had turned his back on France. Zeal for the pursuit of the military art and impatience of all side issues are revealed throughout his memoir. Such entries as these illustrate the point. In 1685, the marriage of an archduchess with the elector of Bavaria, Bavaria retarded the opening of the campaign. A pretty reason, truly. Is that petty or pretty? All right. In 1691, more amours, and for me too, had I been so inclined, I had other matters to attend to. The other matters were usually endless planning. But once he took time off to spend the most agreeable 15 days of his life with his mother, his affection for her seems to have been unclouded by her early neglect of him. The general impression of the memoir supports the opinion of an early biographer, Mauville, that love always appeared to Prince Eugene one of those frivolous emotions which reasonable men should never give way to. Let's see what the published writers, the footnotes. Number nine, concerning that book, Derek McKay and Nicholas Henderson state that no personal papers of Eugene have survived. Memoirs du Prince Eugene de Savoie, published in Weimar by the Prince de Ligny, are said to be a forgery. Eugene's letters published in Tubingen by J.E. Sartori are described as a complete fabrication. 
Curiously about why King Charles the the seventh of Sweden remained unmarried has extended to the similar case of Eugene. Speculations centered upon his long friendship with Countess Eleonora. This is a good one. Bath. Bathiani. Bathiani. When he was in his sixties, he played cards with her almost every day. Mr. McKay's opinion that the relationship amounted to a marriage Though they lived apart, seems very far-fetched, even if Eugene's horses knew their way to her house outside, which his carriage was almost permanently parked. He was also friendly with her friend, Eleonora Stratman, who was apparently more intelligent and was thought to have had more influence over him. Madame de Bathiagne's two sons were rumored to have been Eugene's, but they were in fact born before 1700, when Eugene is said to have first met her when on one of his visits to her father. Nine years younger than Eugene, she seems to have been corrupt and to have had dealings in military performance without Eugene's knowledge. He was strongly averse to women playing any part in politics or public affairs. Eugene never mentioned the Countess in his letters, but in his memoir he wrote, referring to rumors that he intended to marry her when he was 72, that she loved him too well thus to abuse his age, adding... I am almost as much attached to Madame de Stratman as to her sister, my mistress, as she is called. He may have used the word sister in a general sense. The fact that their Christian names were the same seems to indicate that they were not really sisters. If the autobiographical memoir was genuinely written by Eugene, one might conclude from his comments that the belief in diplomatic circles that the countess was his mistress was rooted in the supposition that every aristocrat in his position must have a mistress. The Swedish minister in 1713 wrote that a countess Maria Sternhook had been his, Eugene's, mistress for years, though without quoting any evidence for the statement, Eugene himself, under the date 1732 in his memoir, assures us that he laughed heartily when the Duke de Villars spoke about the rumors that he had a mistress and added that it was rather too late for me to catch the foolish fever called love. Mr. McKay mentions a disparaging comment by a man named Schulenberg that Eugene enjoyed la petite, la petite de boche or la p something all de la de tout, de tout. He adds that Max Braubeck had suggested that La meant peller, pellerdice, prostitution or lewdness or putery, whoring. Voltaire condemned the tendency to judge Eugene by certain excesses of his youth, since all these seem to have been of a homosexual nature. That may, that may have been the imputation of La Pussy, or whatever the hell the P is supposed to mean. Why are they crossing it out if it doesn't? Pudenda? What is it? What is it? Let's see. 12. The French language is rich in rather naughty words beginning with P. Paler dice also means debauchery, dissolute wantonness, and an un. and un penchant au plaisir de la chair, and putery means much the same. Godefroy's Dictionary de l'Ancien Langue Francais indicate in its definitions of paladicer to haunt whores or harlots or men of yevil lineage. I guess lineage. Of low, uh, in fact, hetero or homosexual pranks. Okay, that explains that. Doesn't mean pussy. Though less cultured than Frederick the Great, Eugene was also a patron of the arts and kept in touch with literary men, especially with Jean Baptiste Rousseau, Le Premier de Lyrique Francais, according to biography Michaud. Eugene was a hero to all who were opposed to the domination of Europe by Louis the Fourteenth, and in Britain he was especially popular because of his loyal and unselfish support of Marlborough. A book published by A. Baldwin in 1707, The Life and Actions of Prince Eugene of Savoy, has a preface which states, and that's him, 
right there. Being informed that the life of Prince Eugene of Savoy was printing at The Hague, we applied ourselves to the persons concerned in it and procured the sheets to be sent to us by the post. As they came from the press, as fast as we received them, we got them translated and printed with so much diligence that we can present the public with it in English before any of the French copies come over. That Baldwin should go to all this trouble and present the result for three shillings and sixpence seems to indicate great public interest in Eugene. The pleasantest note on which to take leave of this great soldier is to recall the nobility with which he stood by Marlborough when his comrade was in disgrace. On a visit to London, where he received a hero's welcome, he went out of his way to meet and embrace Marlborough, and to demonstrate that he felt like Marlborough's soldiers did. They had been so dismayed by their chief's fall that, when the Dutch seriously thought of disarming them, they saved them the trouble by breaking their muskets in disgust. At their government's action, Winston Churchill wrote, Nothing in history of civilized peoples has surpassed this black treachery. I should probably stop there, but I'm going to continue since there's only basically three pages left. Charles the the Twelfth, King of Sweden, 1682 to 1718. Charles the Twelfth was even more resolute in his avoidance of female company than his near contemporary Eugene. His early family, and where is that? Freaking his early family. Let's go on and we'll come back to the footnote. Circumstances were not propitious, propitious, pr propitious, for he lost his mother when he was 11 and his father when he was 14. He was awkward and bashful with a strikingly curious face. Eric Linklater, in an introduction to the latest biography, called him a slim, cultish, dedicated, and innocent figure. Figure. Let's see what this uh, footnote referred to. 12. Oh, yeah, we already read that. Shows you how much I'm paying attention. The historian Oscar Browning wrote that the young king's face was as smooth and delicate in complexion as a girl's with pink and white cheeks, which so greatly vexed him that he was actually pleased that it was slightly pockmarked and he took trouble to get well suntanned. Franz Bengston makes a rather pointed comment that in charades he once was a Muscovite, Froken Reed being his wife, an unlikely role for him to play on both kinds. We may suppose the occasion to have been a happy one for Froken Reed. Charles was undoubtedly shy with women, and various proposed political marriages merely encouraged his violent repugnance to all talk of marriage. It is said that when he remained obstinately chaste, showing absolutely no interest in women, some courtiers actually tried to stimulate his dormant sense with aphrodisiacs. On one occasion, it was noticed that the king was very shy and silent, not venturing to glance at two attractive young Polish ladies. He twice went out of his way to avoid Countess Aurora of Koningsmark, who was determinedly setting her cap at him. Probably any young man, king or commoner, might have been concerned to go to any lengths to avoid the countess, who, after a liaison with King Augustus II of Poland, had given birth to an illegitimate son, none other than the future Marshal Saxe. King Augustus unimaginatively sent her to Charles as his emissary, hoping that her charms might prevail where official diplomacy had failed. One might well suppose that all this pointed and rather offensive curiosity about his reactions would have driven the poor young man still further into his shell, reinforcing the tendency to misogyny which his contemporaries suspected. Charles regarded service in the ranks as a valuable, even essential prelude to a commission for aristocrats as well as for commoners. He lived very simply among his soldiers without guards or ceremony. Oscar Browning wrote, His soldiers were devoted to him and looked upon him as a god. And the second volume of Bankston's biography is entitled Wedded to the Rank and File. The king, especially in his youth, was much addicted to high-spirited romps. 
often after drinking bouts. Sometimes these had regrettably sadistic overtones. For example, he organized the calf beheading competition with swords. Even peasants' horses, according to Oscar Browning, were similarly maltreated, and live geese were hung by the feet on gallows when peasants rode through them. Rode through them. Rode through them. On horseback to tear their heads off. Wait a minute. Let's read that again. Even peasants' horses, according to Oscar Browning, were similarly maltreated, and live geese were hung by the feet on gallows when peasants rode through them on horseback to tear their heads off. Charles, however, was not essentially cruel or cold-hearted. He could never speak of his mother without tears. The general tenor of Charles's life, as much as was known of it, inevitably invited speculation. In his own time and later about the nature of his sexual interests, Oscar Browning, who was himself not immune from suspicion of homosexuality, wrote that Charles never had a confident, confidant but many friends whom he loved with deep affection. These included his page, Clink Kallstrom, the darling of his youth, and above all, the little prince whom he loved more than a brother. This little prince was Prince Emmanuel of Württemberg, who joined Charles's headquarters at the age of 14. Charles is said to have delighted in his company and to have grieved deeply at his death. After Charles's first campaign, a page slept in his room, who was ordered away to go to bed at Tattoo. When the king raised a new personal unit, the household squadron, one of the requirements was that all its members should be unmarried. This led someone to ask if it was to be assumed that Charles himself did not intend to marry. This the king denied and said that he would marry when his wars ended in peace, and he would marry for love and never keep a mistress. Since he was only 36 when he died in battle, this impeccable sentiment must leave the question unanswered. He had, after all, only reached the age around which many dedicated soldiers have allowed their thoughts to turn to marriage and eventually settling down. The poor young king was never to bring his wars to a successful conclusion. Despite his acknowledged eminence in the military art, his career, as far as his country was concerned, was a life of failure. He can be credited with at least one good maxim for a soldier, and it is one by which many have lived their lives in war. I shall fall by no other bullet than by that which is destined for me, and when that comes, no prudence will help me. Bankston compares him with Alexander, since it was only with great difficulty that he, Alexander, could be brought into women's society, apart from the certainty that there was no physical disability. Bankston concludes that all is conjecture, and Charles remains a unique phenomenon, detached from ordinary psychology. Voltaire was waspish about Frederick, generous to Eugene, positively glowed about Charles the Twelfth the only person in history who was free from all weakness. The personalities of these two fine soldiers strike me as more dark and mysterious than any of those examined in this book. Charles's conduct during his brief life was certainly such as to justify applying to him Eugene's nickname, Mars Without Venus. Both of them were probably repressed homosexuals. <laughs> I mean, that's a far fucking leap, dude. You don't really know anything about their histories. Charles showed sadistic tendencies, such as are often associated with that deviation, but Eugene may be acquitted on that count, although it is hard to forgive him for his callous attitude to casualties among the soldiers. Both of them seem to have found in soldiering a welcome refuge from the pressure upon aristocrats, and especially upon kings, to marry and father and heir. Eugene... Granted a long life, soldiered on to an advanced age, and in retirement fortunately found contentment in the society of his elderly women friends. Charles died too soon for such a happy outcome, and of course it is possible that he meant what he said, and would eventually have put his pages and other young friends out of his life and turned to a normal marriage, for dynastic reasons, if for nothing else. And that was... Chapter 4, Napoleon is the next one. Impotent emperor. Impotent. Impotent.
All right, bros, that's all. Goodbye.